it is Mother's Day, huh? Are you looking for a traditional Mother's Day message? Good. Good. Because you ain't going to get one. Hallelujah. I am going to invite your attention on, over to John chapter 2. So just take us to the Facebook page, guys. Just go there. Just get it going. Whichever one you choose, that's between you and your God. So this is John's Gospel, chapter 2. Amen. And amen. Glory to God. So at 4 o'clock this morning, I woke up with this. Uh, the application of faith. I woke up with that. The application. The application. The application of faith. I thought that was interesting because uh, <clears throat> sometimes people actually think because they understand the mechanics of faith, you know, just because they understand the mechanics of it, they think they, uh, they can just kind of get by uh, with just the knowledge alone, but you still have to apply faith. There is still an application of faith. Faith without works is dead. You know, and it's, it's one thing to give mental assent. It's one thing just to say, yes, I know, I know that Jesus uh, is, is somebody special. It's another thing to make him special in your heart and life. You can't just acknowledge that he is. He's got to be yours. He's not just the savior of the world. Who is he to you? What is he to you? And so there is an application of faith. And uh, of all the wonderful examples of mothers in the Bible, and there are, there's many wonderful examples of moms in the Bible. I'll tell you, one of them has to stand out from the rest. It's got to be the mother of Jesus. Yeah. She's got to stand out from all the rest. And I want to look at this, this incident here that's recorded uh, because this is, um, this is going to be interesting. I, I, I got some stuff on this, reading it again in John chapter 2. And you understand that uh, uh, we only have a limited number of stories in the Gospels. And I think it's important for people to understand that those limited number of stories are hand-selected by the Holy Spirit for you and for me. So you can never grow tired of hearing the same story because you only have a limited number of stories. But these are the stories that the Lord wanted you to have. Okay, So one of these stories is found in John 2, and we're just going to begin right here in verse number 1. And the third day, <clears throat> this is the King James Version, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. The mother of Jesus was there. Okay. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Verse 4, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. You guys are way too quiet. Woman, what are you doing? It's not my time yet. What are, we, what are you getting me involved for? Why are you involving me in this right now? It's not my time. It's not my hour. This is not the time, Mom. Verse 5, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That is a blessed verse, if ever I read one. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. Man, if that isn't the best advice any mom can give anybody anywhere, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Yeah, but it doesn't fit in with the culture. Yeah, but my friends are going to think I'm wacky. Well, they already think you're wacky. Why disappoint them? Whatever he says to you, do it. And in verse 6, there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. Now at this point, Jesus has done what? He said, mom, what are you doing? Don't involve me. 
I don't know why you're, get, I mean, I don't know why she was involved. I heard one minister say, well, she was the wedding coordinator. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe this was a family wedding and she was involved somehow. Uh, I, would, I would tend to think that because she's concerned herself with the wine, somehow she's responsible for something or making herself responsible for it. I actually heard one chucklehead say that this was actually Jesus' wedding. What is wrong with people? So Jesus then gets involved, but I thought he said, mine hour is not yet come. Why is Jesus getting involved? Because mama, so. mama said so. There it is. The influence of your mother is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, but this, is, this ain't just anybody here. No, we're talking about Jesus the one who emptied himself of divine rights and privileges, the one who needed his mama to nurse him, the one, excuse me, today, let's be politically correct, he needed his mother to chest feed him. But should we call Mary the mother, or do we call her a they, or an it, or whatever? You get the point, right? Ridiculous. Absolutely insane. This is Jesus who was completely dependent upon his mother's care because he emptied himself of divine rights and privileges. He lived as a man. He lived like you and me. He had to be tended to. He had to be taken care of. He had to have his nose wiped, his diaper changed. He had to be taught by mom how to eat properly at the table. And I'm just, you, know, you understand what I'm saying. Mom had a whole lot of influence, didn't she? Moms have a whole lot of influence. And, and so Jesus gets involved because mama said so. Well, mama said. Man, I, I, don't, I don't really think that we fully understand Jesus. I don't think we do. Because growing up in the denomination that I did, everything was so spooky spiritual. And everything was so... Um, I mean, you know, silence becomes the house of the Lord. And everything had to be done a certain way. And I didn't know any better. Heck, what did I know? And, and, and then you start learning about Jesus and you start learning about the, the different facets of, of, of who he was and what he did. And, and, and you're thinking, wait a minute. He really was 100% human and 100% God. He wasn't a 50-50 blend. He didn't operate with divine rights and privileges because the Bible said he emptied himself of divine rights and privileges. And why in the world, world would he become so vulnerable as to be a baby? And helpless, in, you understand that at one point he was helpless. You understand that. This is just boggling. It just, it's crazy when I think about this. And, and when I think about his life and I think about what he did, it gives me so much hope because he showed me that it is possible for me to be successful. He showed me that I could do this life of faith. I can be successful as a mere man <clears throat> with limitations and failures and shortcomings, with weaknesses. And mama said, get involved, son. And he said, it ain't my time. Okay, mom. All right, mom. All right. And I love this because in verse 7, here's faith. Here's faith right here. Jesus said to the servants, because in verse 5, the mother said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. And so in verse 7, Jesus says to the servants, hey, fill those water pots with water. Watch this. And they filled them up to the brim. They did that. They filled these water pots. Now, these weren't little, little jugs, you know. They filled them up. But notice in verse 8, he saith unto them, draw out now and do what? Bring it to the governor of the feast. Now, this is water we just put in here. And now, we, we're not dumb. We know that they're out of wine and mama said, get involved. And, and Jesus said, go ahead and fill these things with water. And now take that water and bring it to the... Wait, it's water. She, we need wine, though. I'm not going to do this because this is embarrassing and insane. 
They, need wa- they, they don't need water, they need wine. But what did they do? They bear it. They brought water. To, it says to the governor of the feast. They brought water. So what happened from that point until in verse, let's see, verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, what happened then? It was tur- it, when did it turn into wine? When they began to apply the faith. That's when it turned. That's when it switched over. And they knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water, they knew what was going on. They're like, oh, snap. Oh, snap. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and he said, hey, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. So in other words, listen, early on in the party when people aren't drunk, you're going to give them the good stuff. But then when they start having too much to drink, then you can give them the cheap junk because they don't know any better. Every man sets forth the good stuff at the beginning and then when they have well drunk, then they bring that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. Verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the beginning of the miracles. And according to what Jesus said, his time wasn't yet to do this. And yet he did it. And God honored it, didn't he? God honored it. This is the beginning of of the miracles. This is the first of the miracles. And isn't it curious that the very first of the miracles takes place at a wedding, a happy occasion, and it includes what? Wine. Well, back then it was just grape juice. There was no fermenting. Well, that's not according to what the governor of the feast said. The governor of the feast said before they get to really drink, and people normally give them the good stuff, but after they get good and toasty, You saved the good stuff until afterwards. So we know that people drank wine and could get themselves drunk with it. And yet Jesus went ahead and did what? Turned water into wine. Of course, in Ephesians 5, he said, don't get drunk with wine wherein is excess. So there is a balance to everything. There's a balance to everything in life. And I'm wondering if sometimes we're too far to the left or too far to the right, and we miss out on the miracles. Because I got my principles. I got my principles. I got my way I do things. Huh. Huh. You know, and, and here's the thing. We're not that smart. We think we are, and we're not. I don't know everything. The longer I do this, the more I realize how little I actually do know, and I'm so dependent on Him, it's scary. I'm so dependent on the Holy Spirit. I'm so dependent on Him. And then you realize that, wow, I really am not all of that in the bag of chips. I thought that I was. But that's the point, is that regardless of how bad you are, regardless of how off you might be or confused you might be or sad you might be or lonely you might be, regardless of whatever you're lacking and missing, guess what? He makes it all up. If you'll just stay open, if you'll just, keep the, if you'll just keep the perspective, hey, mom told me to get involved. Well, this, who is she to tell Jesus, the son of God, to get involved? That's his mama. You, sometimes you're just going to have to talk to God, real plain and simple, like I did with Jeff. I said, God, I need him. I need that man. He's too great an asset around here. He does too much for me. And I don't know how you're going to do it, but I want him back in church without surgery. You talk to God that way? Yeah. I wonder what I'm talking to God about you. What are me and God discussing about you? And wouldn't you like to know? See, sometimes we're just going to have to tune. Just bring it down a notch and stop being so spiritual about everything. Like you got to have a word from the prophet just so you can make up your mind what you're going to eat that day. I don't need no prophet to tell me what to eat. I'm hungry. I know how to eat. Jesus said, my time is not yet. He knew. Jesus knew what was going on. But within the grand scheme, within the grand picture, there was room enough for grace and honor and love. You don't have to have it all together to get your prayers answered. 
So sometimes <clears throat> it just helps just to be real and honest. Mama said, get involved. It's not my time yet. I could just picture Jesus saying, woman, come on, girl. You know better. You know I got work to do. You know I got my father's business to be about. What are you trying to get me involved for? All right. All right. Go fill those pots up, guys. Go fill them up. And they filled them up to the brim. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so Mama said, <laughs> Whatever he says to you, do it. Just what do you think Jesus might be saying to you today? Because that's good advice. No matter where you find yourself, no matter what's going on, what could he be saying to you today? Well, I'll tell you what he's saying. Be careful. Be careful. Oh, we, these, are, these are tough times. We got to get, you know, we got to buckle down. We got to do this and we got to do that. You know, one thing I've been noticing is that some people are so fixated on the rapture. You get so fixated on the rapture that you forget that there's still work to be done. I'm not looking to jump on out of here but it's getting tough. Did he not tell you that it was going to get more difficult? Did he not tell you to expect persecution? Did he not tell you there was going to be obstacles and, and things, uh, I mean, unparalleled? In, uh, he told you this. And the problem is we don't want to go through anything tough and difficult because we like a certain level of comfort, don't we? We like our lattes a certain way. You know, we like our climate, uh, we like our temperature set a, a certain, you know, there's so many things we just, sometimes you just want to take the American church and shake her and say, will you stop? Yeah. It's not about you. It's not about your comfort. It's about people that are dying right now and going into an eternity without Jesus. That's what it's about. Right now, while we're sitting here listening to this message, and trying to get focused on what God is saying to us, there are people going right off into eternity, and they're lost forever. That's what it's about. But for starters, I wanted to just remind you just of a few things that the Lord Jesus is telling you today. Because Mama said, whatever He says to you, do it. Whatever he, That's the best thing that my mom could have instilled in me was faith to believe God, to not let go, to trust God. And of course, there was a certain time, a season in my life when mom had to carry me on her faith. That's a good thing, that you have people who are willing to carry you on their faith until you find your own faith. You're not to be carried for the rest of your life. I mean, Mason's getting to be pretty big. I don't think his dad wants to be carrying him in and out of stores right now. <laughs> and he's only going to get bigger from here. But there was a time, and I notice he'll carry Evie a lot, but just like you, you grow, you develop, you stand on your own. That's the goal of what we do for our children, right? But the one thing I have to tell you that Jesus is saying to you today, and you can make a note of these four references because they all say exactly the same thing. Number one, this is what Jesus is saying to you today. It's found in Habakkuk, so just abbreviate H-A-B, Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11 and Hebrews 10.38. What's Jesus saying? Whatever he says, do it. Those four references, all four of them say, the just shall live by faith. Doesn't say the just will live by their religion. It doesn't say the just will live by their education. Education is important. But it's telling us the just shall live by faith. How important is faith? Well, if he's telling you to live by it, whatever he says, do it. Yeah. Whatever he says, do it. What do I do now? Live by faith. What do I do now? He's in the hospital. Do it by faith. Do it by faith. Believe by faith. Trust. Whatever it is that you're going through. I know, the I know it gets a little bit challenging at times when you're surrounded by all kinds of equipment in the hospital and, and people are unresponsive and, and, and you're like, my God. Well, whatever he says, do it. What's he saying? 
Live by faith. Do this by faith. Not a single one of us has an exemption from this. That means every believer that you know or will ever know, Jesus is saying, the just shall live by faith. So why would you want to do it any other way? Why are you looking for an exemption or a clause to get out of this? By faith. Faith doesn't mean that he takes you out of the difficulty, you know. Faith has never meant that he's going to take you out of the challenge. But it does mean that you're going to get through that thing. You're going to be more than a conqueror right in the midst of it. You're not stalling out in that valley. I mean, death is casting its shadow all around you. But, and you're not going to stall out, but you are just going to keep passing right on through. Faith is an important subject, and there's different ways that we approach this. But you've got to understand, if mama's telling us, because <laughs> the mama of all mamas, am I right? The mama of all mamas said, whatever he says, do it. And he said, the just shall live by faith. That's his word. He gave you four different references. He must be serious about this. So make it your business to find out, how do I live by faith? And faith doesn't mean a, a feeling, if you will. Oh, I feel excited. I feel encouraged. I must be in faith. Not necessarily. I feel excited and encouraged when I have a good pizza. <laughs> it blesses me. <clears throat> yeah, amen. You know, but faith is not a feeling. Faith is a fact. It is an absolute fact. It's settled and based upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Number two, you can make, make a note of Hebrews eleven six. You cannot please God without faith. Hebrews eleven six. In fact, we'll just go ahead and read that real quick here. The mother of all mothers said, whatever he says to you, just do it. Well, I'm going to make it my business to learn how to live by faith. I'm making it my business to do that. I don't care what's going on around me. I don't care what anybody's threatening me with. I'm going to live by faith. Well, that's foolishness. It's not foolishness. It's not foolishness. I mean, to, yeah, to people who don't know any better, they're going to look at you like you're some type of a nutcase. I mean, you know, when you walk into a hospital room and you're talking to somebody who's unresponsive and you're calling them the heel of the Lord and you shall not die, but you're going to live and declare the works of the Lord. In fact, I specifically said, Jeff ain't dying. He's going he's to live and help me declare the works of the Lord. Sorry, Jeff, if you were looking to get out early. It wasn't happening on my watch. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. That's right. That's exactly right. But here in, in Hebrews 11, notice it says this. It says in verse number 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. It doesn't say difficult. Did you notice that? It is impossible. It is impossible to please Him, for he that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a disappointer of them that diligently seek Him. No, it says He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. By the way, this chapter, this 11th chapter of Hebrews is the great uh, hall of faith, if you will. You've got examples of people uh, operating in faith, and so now they're recorded forever in this uh, hall of faith here. Faith is, faith is a very important subject, more than people might realize, and so when we come to church, at the very least, you should expect to hear a message on de faith development, if you will. Yeah, but I like to hear nice stories. Okay, you get those here too. Well, you know, I like good lessons and practical. You know, listen, here's the thing. I'm going to focus on faith. That's what this church is all about, building faith for life. That's what we focus on. And we're not going to do you any disservice by talking about faith on Mother's Day, are we? Because the just shall live by faith. You can't please God without faith. And then number three, here's one you might want to remember. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye, this is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourselves. In other words, you can't earn salvation. You might as well stop trying. Just receive it as a free gift and walk in the reality of it. In other words, if you believe that the blood of Jesus has cleansed you, 
If you believe that you are forgiven, then act like it. Stop wallowing in self-pity and condemnation. That condemnation and self-pity comes because of the behavior that you are, be, you are uh, um, um, uh, about some, some behavior that's causing that, that, that feeling, that guilt and that condemnation. But you could, you could be in the midst of the worst sin possible and you're still forgiven and you're still cleansed. Even while I'm robbing the bank, even while you're robbing the bank, you're just making a very bad choice that's going to give you a prison ministry. <laughs> and so here's the thing. The enemy has people trapped in a lie. You're free already. You're saved already. God's not angry with you. He's not angry at any of us. I mean, even if you are robbing the bank, even if you are doing something terrible, you are still his little boy and his little girl. My goodness gracious, think about your own little precious little child. You love them. You'll do anything for them. You want them to be free. You want them to be happy. That's what he wants for us. He's not endorsing the behavior. I mean, listen, grace is not a license to sin. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a license for you just to do whatever you want. He wants you to do better, but God is... He's for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. I want you free. I want you happy. I don't want you being beat up and abused by the enemy because of that behavior. Because that's all that it is. It's just being abused by the enemy. That's one thing I got to tell you. You know, when I was in the condition I was in B.C. before commitment, uh, it was a bad situation and bad times in my life. But there were some amazing people who just loved me and never made me feel inferior. My mom was one of them. She was my greatest uh, cheerleader, if you will. My biggest support team was my mom. Moms have a way of doing that, don't they? And, and that, gives you, that gives you enough um, of a platform to just begin to change. It's like, well, mom, mom believes in me. She thinks I'm the best thing going. And I know I'm the sorriest loser out there. Yeah, but don't stay there. Don't stay there. Come on over into that, into that grace that says, hey, you're a, you're a champion. You're everything I made you. You are exactly who I said you are. You have exactly what I said you have, and you can do everything I said you can do. Now stop believing the lie. Stop believing the lie. You're saved by grace through faith. That is a fact. It is done. Nobody can alter that. Did you give your heart and life to Jesus? Yes, I did. Well, then you are saved. Now, you may not be experiencing salvation the way God intends for you. You may not be experiencing it to its fullness, but that doesn't alter the fact that you are just what he said you are. Even with oxygen, even toting those two tanks, yeah, I'm everything he said I am. Well, how could Terry be so sure? Because it is written. Because it's in the word. All oh, that's just fanatical. Well, so be it. If it's fanatical, it just means I'm more excited than you are about God. If I'm a fanatic, then that's all that means. I'm holding on to the word. And that's, let me tell you something. We're coming to a point in time, this is all you're going to have. You're going to have to hold on to it. Because they are pulling everything apart. They're pulling everything out. They're pulling everything out from underneath us. It's like it's insane what you're dealing with now. And when I mentioned that thing about chest feeding, that's legit. That is actual what's happening. You can't say breastfeeding anymore. Well, <laughs> what the heck is it? Well, you know, pregnancy is not just for women. Well, who's it for? I mean, the insanity, it's just beyond. It boggles my mind. Right. And when we want to support abortion, it's it's OK to say that it ain't a child and and use all these expressions and terms. But but then now, you know, now that we want to make sure that women have the right because it's their body, their choice. I mean, it, there's, there's so much confusion going on right now that your head spins and people don't even realize how dumb they sound and act. Hmm. Praise the Lord. I better back up off of that. I want to be naughty on Mother's Day. And Mama said, don't do it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
Let me give you this last one because this is important for you guys, and I know you guys are going to have to take off back there. Uh, let me give you this last one. Write these verses down, if you will. This is, we're going to conclude with these two. Um, we're going to give you 1 John 5, 4, and let me read that to you. 1 John 5, 4, and it says this, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It's our faith that overcomes. Our faith is the victory that overcomes. Your faith is the victory that overcomes. But notice in Ephesians 6, so back up left, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Somebody moved Ephesians on me. Who did that? That's it. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Ephesians 6, we're going to conclude with this. So number one, what's Jesus saying to you? The just shall live by faith. That includes you and me. There's no exemption. There's no loophole. You have to do this by faith. But I don't want to. Well, I'm sorry. There's no other way to do it. This is what Jesus said. So whatever Jesus says, do it. So take a stand in faith, take your stand on the word, and you'll be doing what Jesus said, the just shall live by faith. Can't please God without faith. Okay, well then stop trying to please God by your good works. You ever notice people want to just kind of promote everything? Hey, look at, look at what I'm doing for God. Goody, goody gumdrops. What has that got to do with anything? Can't please God without faith. You're going to, where are you going? Ephesians 6, yeah. You're, you're holding your position right there, and you're saved by grace through faith. You are. You are already saved. Now, you may not be experiencing salvation the way that God wants you to, but you are still saved by grace through faith, regardless of your behavior. Your behavior will just compromise your experience. Your behavior will open you up to the enemy. Listen, you don't need nobody to harass you about sin. When you're sinning, you know it. Come on, you ain't dumb. Don't let them tell you anything different than that. When I'm sinning, I know I am. What do you do about it? I say, Father, forgive me. I had three, I had three of Julie's brownies. Actually, I had four in one sitting. And then Diane had to go bring more brownies over. And I'm like, I'm doomed. I mean, I'm, I'm double fisting brownies. And then, number four, we overcome and we extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy by faith. This is Ephesians 6, verse 16. You ready? In conclusion, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench not most of the fiery darts, but all of them. You know what a fiery dart will do? If they were throwing fiery darts in here and it landed on the pew, that pew's going to go up in flames and it's going to spread. You know, you, a fiery dart lands on the carpet, the carpet's going to catch on fire. But that shield of faith, you can catch that sucker and it'll extinguish it. It's like throwing a fiery dart into concrete. Is, does concrete burn, Brother Chief, over there? No. I mean, you got to be careful. Make yourself to the point. Get yourself to the point where you're walking in faith every minute of, of every day so that when the fiery darts come, and they will, you can extinguish them. You don't have to run around and try to get everybody in the world praying for you. You don't have to go get the prayer tower, the fire tower, the watch tower, and, and you spend more time on the phone rehearsing and rehashing the problem instead of just standing in faith Instead of just standing in faith, and then we want to get on the computer and research the problem, we spend more time researching the problem and notifying the prayer warriors, more time doing that than we actually do doing what? Uh, uh, uh. I don't know, I'm just saying. It's not easy. I'll tell you what, if I called you every time I... <laughs> If, 
every time I felt like I wasn't going to make it and the circumstance wasn't going to turn around, if I call you, I'd be calling you all the time. Instead, I'm just standing and saying, nope, don't think so. He's coming home. He's coming home. He's coming home. We're getting him back. He's coming home. So what will faith do? You can overcome every obstacle and you can extinguish every fiery dart. Whatever he says to you, do it. What's he saying to you? I'm, uh, let me summarize. Develop your faith. Be strong in faith. Every day of your life, don't miss an opportunity to develop your faith. Glory to God. Father, I want to thank you that your word will not return unto you void. I thank you that our faith grows exceedingly. I thank you, Father, we are overcoming every obstacle and we are extinguishing every fiery dart with the shield of faith. I thank you that we are pleasing unto you by growing and developing in our faith. I thank you that we are living this life of faith. We are doing it by faith. I thank you that by grace we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift that you have given to us. And we rejoice and we thank you, Father, for the gift of salvation in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.